granite shores and wooden lands of the north its history of copper mines and iron ore the great lakes fishery to the farmlands of the southern counties we'll look around my friend and all that waits the sportsmen in the state of michigan and sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow and the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold the wind might whisper through the trees listen if you can Tells you all the beauty in the state of Michigan. Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost, and this evening's show is going to be an interesting one. We have sort of lightweight features. I mean, we have our recipe, a great recipe for soup, and we have our perch fishing trip to South Haven, which we took last year, finally slammed the perch. And we're going to get into a heavy-duty controversy, that of trapping. We're going to talk to Dr. Jim Sikarski, who's a wildlife rehabilitator, find out some pros and cons of trapping, especially the positive side you might be surprised. You stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. His name is Jim Sikarski, Dr. Jim Sikarski. He's a wildlife rehabilitator with the College of Veterinary Medicine at Michigan State University. He and his students rehabilitate over 600 animals a year, some 120 or so are birds of prey, and in most cases, they're returned to the wild. But what does returning to the wild mean? In view of the recent controversy over trapping, I asked Dr. Sikarski to give me his point of view. His comments don't represent the College of Veterinary Medicine or Michigan State University. They're his own, but they're based on a lifetime of working with animals. If we didn't remove those animals uh, uh, and disease or parasites are what kill them, that, they're suffering with that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's plus the potential. I think that's one that, one, you know, this is an, an issue that I struggle with. Uh, you know, being a rehabilitator, taking care of wildlife and all. Um, it would be easy to say we shouldn't trap at all, uh, but I recognize, you know, I have a, a degree in population dynamics and wildlife ecology, uh, fisheries and wildlife, uh, and, you know, I think that there's got to be management. At, th at this point, you know, we've, we've assumed or it's been thrust upon us the responsibility of managing wild populations. Hunting and trapping are management tools, there's no question about it. If we did not remove the surplus animals, they're going to uh, breed uh, and exceed the carrying capacity of their habitat and then die from starvation or disease or parasites, which is inhumane, or certainly some of those diseases and parasites can kill people or affect the livestock that we raise for our own use. Well, what, what happens to all of the muskrats and rabbits and foxes? I mean, they have relatively short lifespans. Hunters and trappers only take a smidgen. Well, what think, happens to the rest? Well, a lot of them die during the winter because of uh, the, the, the stress, the cold, the lack of food. Do, do that, they die happily, peacefully? Oh, see, uh, I, that's about as controversial as how much pain does sitting in a trap cause. I don't know how happy they are when they're starving. They can't be. Um, I mean, are, are there deaths, often violent deaths, or...? Sure. I mean, if they're preyed upon by other predators, if they, if they just don't have enough to eat or if they're sick because of a heavy burden of parasites, they m crawl off under a brush pile and die and nobody knows they were even there. Um, that's why I think most of the hunting and trapping is done in the fall. There's been studies that show that the, the majority of those animals that are removed by trappers would have died during the winter, would have starved. Uh, in or died from disease. Uh, Mother Nature has to keep the population down. And if we, if we trap that surplus, um, then we remove the, that overpopulation and we use it as a resource, as a renewable resource, but we also then are, in some ways, keeping those populations healthy and stable within the carrying capacity of the habitat rather than these big peaks and troughs mm -hmm. of animals where at the peak the the disease, the loss, lack of food and that kills off the animal. Um, and, and also we've selected against a lot of the natural predators that used to help modulate the peaks and troughs of mm -hmm. those population fluxes. And, and I think the responsibility for management now is, uh, is with the wildlife manager. This is one that is a basic question that is coming up more and more and more. The animal rights organization calls themselves animal rights. And I see more and more it being questioned, 
what rights do animals have? When we talk about rights, that's a human thing. You have a right to free speech. You have a right to, you know, yeah. certain things. And there's responsibilities that go with rights. Now, what well, about... As, as a, I, I like to think of it as animal welfare, that, that especially as a veterinarian, I want to minimize suffering. I, I, I wouldn't trap now. Um, I'd have a hard time with that. Um, but I'd, if I did, I'd want to make sure that I did it in the best way possible. The, the animal welfare movement is, it has been very good, I think. Mm -hmm. the, the proper housing and care of animals to minimize suffering and, uh, and uh, you know, get the most good with the least harm. Well, I think we all agree with that. Yes. The, the neutering of animals, the making sure they're fed and bringing actions against people to treat their pets inhumanely. I can't imagine a person uh, in this world who would be against that. Mm -hmm. But moving this up to the level of rights, that the animals have the same rights as people do. That's an argument that, uh, y you know, is so fraught with emotion and um, some of the animal rights organizations uh, spend a great deal of time writing and uh, portraying images that tear at people's heartstrings to, to play on that emotions. And mm -hmm. that, that, that's why it's such a controversial issue. It's, uh, it's one that, um, I don't know, people have to make up their own uh, mind on and uh, hopefully on biological information, good sound information on you know, that's part of the reason why I agreed to come here and talk to you, is that hopefully the information that uh, um, is received from this kind of a discussion will help people put those issues, hunting and trapping and their importance as, as management, into perspective. And if they need to be done, then they need to be done well. Uh, if we're going to have to use trapping as a management tool, and I don't see a good alternative for some of these species like the price of pelts is so low for beaver that uh, people aren't trapping them because it's, it's a big job to go out and run that big of a trap line. I was talking to a friend in Twin Cities, Minnesota. Their beaver are moved into the city. They're damming up culverts and flooding mm -hmm. subdivisions even. It's, uh, you know, it, it, you can laugh about it, but they also have Giardia and Tularemia and that uh, um, bacteria or protozoan in somebody's backyard where their children play can have pretty serious implications. And the need to manage those populations is, is obvious. And, and somebody has to have that responsibility. And, and people can be really upset that trapping and uh, things like that are used to manage those populations. But, boy, it, it needs to be done. The virtues of starvation over trapping or diseases over hunting may be argued. But if healthy, stable wildlife populations are the goal and threats to human health are to be minimized, management, some form of wildlife management, is unavoidable. And to date, nobody has come up with a practical alternative to hunting or trapping. Turkey season is upon us, and here's a gobbler with a 9 and an 8 inch beard called in near Alpena by Michael Flights from Interlaken. Dan Manville from Traverse City made history last year with his 1 pound 7 ounce hybrid sunfish taken from Arbutus Lake. Now that was a new state record. Bob Fritz from DeWitt took this 10 pound 4 ounce walleye 32 inches long from Portage River in Houghton casting Arapala. Fishing with a smelled at 3 a.m. off the pier at Oscoda was Mark Parker, who caught this trophy 10-pound, 4-ounce bourbon. Only 32 inches long, this brown trout weighed over 21 pounds. Karen Wilcox from Jackson caught it at the end of April in Lake Michigan off Berrien County. Now here's a big Van Buren County buck that weighed an estimated 240 pounds. Had 10 antler points with a 21 and 3 8 inch spread. The longest tine was over 11 inches and Larry Mallory lucked into it on opening morning on his own farm. We hunted all morning long, had a few of my buddies out there hunting. We was hunting all morning long when I come back to the house. One of my buddies said, he said, we seen that big buck that you seen during bow season go down in the swamp behind the house. So we all had a cup of coffee, we spread out. I just picked the right spot and I sit there and a doe come running down by me and I waited it down, got by him pretty soon. This guy come out, come running down, jumped behind a brush pile 15 yards from me, stood there. All I could see was his horns turning back and forth, couldn't get a shot at him. Well, to make a long story short, Larry Mallory from Lawton was in the right place at the right time. He bagged the buck and became our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Hunter of the Week.
The gun control issue has sort of been boiled down by the events in Lithuania. Gorbachev's telling Lithuanians to turn in their hunting guns or have the Soviet army confiscate them has a familiar yet very sour historical ring to it. Now remember it was King George III's armies that sent out, were sent out to confiscate guns and powder in Lexington and Concord 215 years ago this month. It was the British Army demanding even sympathetic gun makers to hand over the guns they had made that turned Tory gun makers against the King. Those were the events that led to the Second Amendment of the Constitution, the right to bear arms, equal in the Bill of Rights to freedom of speech, religion, and press. So what's the tie with current times? Well, there are bills now pending in the U.S. Senate to take away rabbit and squirrel guns once again. That's no joke. Semi-automatic shotguns and rifles and, of course, handguns are on the chopping block right now. Letters to senators protesting these bills are definitely in order. And therein lies the difference between gun owners in Lithuania and those of us here in the United States. Lithuanians must spill their blood to defend their guns. All it costs us is a stamp and some ink. A European fish was introduced to the eastern United States in 1877 by the U.S. Fish Commission. It's highly prized as food in Europe, but is disdained by American anglers. What is it? The carp. Because its spring breeding habits in shallow water destroy the eggs and breeding places of more valued native fish, Americans have never been fond of the carp. Coming up in just a couple weeks here on many PBS stations is the annual auction they use for fundraising. We always donate a perch fishing trip off South Haven. And while some years we catch more perch than others, last year, oh, we really slammed them. Off Southern California and Florida, there are lots of boats like this. They're called party boats. They take out lots of anglers. This one, the Captain Nichols II, takes out about 40, 45 fishermen. We're out on a trip perch fishing off in southern Lake Michigan. South Haven is the port. Lots of boats in and out of this port, many of them in July fishing for perch. Captain Don Nichols Jr. is at the helm guiding the boat through the pier heads. There, by the way, there's lots of folks on those piers catching perch, but we're going to go out to the fishing grounds, the rock piles where they bring in the jumbos. Some anglers were ahead of us. There they are. Oh, look at that, pulling in a jumbo perch. That's the type we like to catch. Perch are, are about the tastiest fish you can catch in the Great Lakes. An excellent eating fish. They don't fight a lot, but they are fun to catch. And if you're lucky and have a good day, you'll catch lots of them. In years past, on this trip in July, we haven't caught lots of them. But today, as the anchor went down, one came aboard. First bliss, first fish for... Uh... $20, was it? First fish for $20. That's the pot that the customers put together on their own for the first fish. But now look at this. This is real time. This is after the first fish was caught. The camera swung around and another came aboard a jumbo perch and it was a double. Oh, the nice fish, too. Dude, yeah. Double. Oh, look, a double. A double. Nice fish. Get him in. Swing him in. Whoa. A double. Whoa. A double. Whoa. Look. Get him in here. <laughs> Look at these. Oh, there's the big one of the. There's the big fish. Holy cats. Say what, two minutes we've been here? Yeah, <laughs> just put it in two minutes. There she is. Look at that. Holy cats. That, you, I think you got the winner already. Oh, my man. I think that's a keeper. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, today I can't believe the number of jumbos and number of just nice, respectable perch we've caught. Yeah, that's, there's some nice ones here. The water's been cold for the last three or four days and they haven't been eaten. And sooner or later they got to turn on and when they do, they just go like gangbusters. They're just like today, which has been pretty good. The other thing, too, that I've, oops, I think I have another one here. Oh, God, I can't believe it. I didn't even bait that other hook. Okay, yep, I got another one here. A little oh, bit. nice one, yeah, nice one. Respectable perch. Not many of the real small ones you had to throw back. No, no, not today. It's pretty, pretty good. Now, most of the time when you go out, 
do you find that the water is as calm as it is? I mean, to, I mean, this is a beautiful day for fishing. Yeah, it's uh, the last three weeks have been like this. We've only had a couple days where it's gotten a little rough, and uh, this is uncommon for this time of year. And the lake's gotten real nice, water's gotten clear, and that's made for some pretty good fishing. We've had some east winds this week though, which has cooled the water down, and that's why it's been tough fishing this Here's morning. A double. Yeah. This morning was, wasn't very good. Uh, we only took 100 fish this morning on the whole boat. So that's why I decided to try something new. We've, we've got to take close to 1,000 on this trip. Yeah, I'm sure they'll, they'll do us a fish count on the way in just to see. But uh, the last one was over 500, and that was a couple hours ago. Holy cats. I tell you, I, this, this, is, this is hot fishing. The nice thing about this, too, is you got some elbow room. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, it's, it's comfortable. Right. I can bring the kids along and, and have a good time. That's what we're catering to. You know, that's, Try to make it nice. I only had one bait on there too. How'd you decide on this place so Don? Uh last year we ran a trip up here once a week and I got to learn the grounds pretty good and that trip didn't work out. Uh, it was an all day trip. People didn't like to go that long. So uh, we didn't do it anymore. But when the fishing gets tough down there, I'll just start working my way up here. And today I just thought I'd go for it and run all the way up here. Uh -huh. I'm glad I did. Jumbo! All right. Jumbo. <laughs> now that's the way, that's the way I like to catch perch. Is is it pretty much hit and miss when it comes to perch fishing out of South that's, Haven? Yeah, yeah. That's one day you'll go out and do just like this, and I can come out here tomorrow and get 10 fish. You know, that's hit and miss. Uh -huh. When do, does it get better as the summer progresses? Usually in August, it's pretty steady. You can come out here and do pretty good. The lake stays calm like it is now, and the water gets up to the right temperature. and. And uh, they do real good, get a lot of consistent catches. Now, last year with your dad, we were out, I think it was in July, and man, it was, it was well, it was the first major storm and the first rain kind of broke mm -hmm. the back of that yeah. drought we had last year. Yeah, I know. I followed him in, and I got hit by a water spout about a mile and a half behind you guys. That's one of the worst blows I've been in with this boat. Uh-huh. Well, and, and, but we were perfectly safe out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. It just uh, slowed down, let it go on by, and it never got real rough, just a lot of rain. And, follow the radar on home. Okay, now tell me t tell me one the answer to one little question, old yep. mighty yep. captain here. I started out using the uh, minnows like virtually everyone did. Uh -huh. And I couldn't buy a hit. All of a sudden I went to the crawdad tails. Yeah, that's uh, must be just a bait that's in the area. The crabs like the rocks and we're on real, some real heavy rocks here. And if that's what's down there, then that's what they're gonna feed on. Uh, Crabs and cutbait have been working the best today. Crabs and cutbait? Cutbait, okay. yeah, could you Could you show us how the cutbait works? Okay, I've got one piece left on here, I believe. Okay. Uh, cutbait is? Just cut a flayed perch, and we skin it, and then cut it up in little okay. quarter-inch chunks. You just stick that on there, and you usually get four or five fish with it. That's perch fillet? That's perch fillet. And you just, just stick a chunk of it just on there? Just stick a chunk on there, and then I'll, I'll put some other bait on the bottom. But once the fish are going good, and you can go to that cut bait, like I said, you can get four or five fish on each bait, and you don't have to be baiting all the time. I'll be darned. <laughs> and that's what I got the bigger ones on, like that one right there was on cut bait. Well, cut bait performed well on this day, as well as crayfish, minnows, anything you wanted to put down. But, you know, one of the highlights of fishing on a party boat isn't just the fish you catch that you can eat later. It's the galley. For me, it's always been the highlight of party boat fishing when I've done it in Southern California and now on the Great Lakes. And you know that this man was in absolute heaven. Now, I don't know how many burgers this was that he downed, but let me tell you, they were tasty. And so are the perch that we're going to have later. Lots of them and big ones. What a great day on the Great Lakes. <laughs> Daddy Borgnay sent us a recipe for Daddy's Dump It All In Soup. And this actually goes all in one pot, which does make it nice if you're camping or, or for deer camp. And there's the venison burger. <laughs> Is that the same venison <laughs> burger we had last week? No, this one doesn't <laughs> have all the fat in it. It um, has quite a bit less fat, as a matter of fact. Hmm. And this doesn't call for any oil or anything in the pan. The oil or fat is going to come right out of the meat. Then going to add your chopped onions and a little bit of beef flavored mm. bouillon. That will give it its base flavor, basically. You know, in a vegetable soup, I, 
I'm not wild about all the grease and the fat that a lot right. of people, when they put meat in. You don't need it at all. And there's a secret ingredient to this is a cumin. Holy <laughs> moly, that much cumin? <laughs> yep, exactly. And it's not a hot spice at all. It's just a oh, no, real it's a, good, flavorful. It's what makes it uh, makes foods have sort of a Mexican taste. Right, of that taste. chili taste. And you got your tomato juice and then stewed mm. tomatoes and then green beans. And this is a French-style green beans. You don't drain them first. So go ahead and add everything. And this recipe has a lot of different textures Boy, and sure flavors does. to it and shapes. Um, it's got your grated carrot rather than chopped and just chopped cabbage. Mm. And a little bit of garlic powder, and then it's just going to simmer for two hours. Let well, everything can, blend together. You can see why she calls it dump it in soup. <laughs> it's just exactly what it is. Huh, well, you know, I wonder, out of all these ingredients... Which one Bob Garner's going to pick out as his favorite? Oh, I love cabbage. Oh, man. I, I, I love I, I, cabbage, but I love venison. I like mm -hmm. the beans in here. I like the, I like, I like the, the burger, the broth, the, every, every, everything about this. As a matter of fact, if, if one wanted to achieve absolute perfection with this recipe, all they'd have to do is just a fresh loaf of homemade bread and about a pound of butter. Yeah. No, no, okay. no. Oh, yeah. Look at this. And, and this, and it would have absolutely a hearty, per, you know, perfect dinner. You know, I wasn't too sure about this when I first looked at it. The green beans in here? Oh. Yeah, I can't taste the green beans, but no, I can, can I can taste that cabbage, and I absolutely love it, and the spice. A little bit of cumin, cumin just a tiny oh. hint of it. I, it just tastes terrific. And that's it really adds what, to it. That's what we were, we were saying earlier. Is probably uh, probably you could even do this with sauerkraut. I just suppose. absolutely delicious. I wouldn't change a thing. No, I wouldn't. I I'm going to start this. putting cumin in other dishes yeah, too. Yeah, we talked about that. When and we I think I'll throw it. some cabbage in. And how, <laughs> and how about that loaf of freshly baked bread, warm? <laughs> Where could you find this mouth-watering recipe? But get outdoors this weekend if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we're going to take a look at our spring and summer fishing forecast around the state, the species that are hot, and maybe some of the species that won't be as hot as they have been in years past. We'll look at the trout, salmon, bass, walleye, the whole spectrum of fishing. So be sure you join us. That's next week, right here, Michigan Outdoors on Public TV.